There's a hand. Excellent. So on occasion, we'll be asking. We'll be asking you to share these God stories. So you can be thinking about this during the week as you come on a Sunday morning, uh, and we can just sing God's praises. Great. Pastor Steve. Good morning. That was a seamless transition. I showed up late this morning and didn't get to do the mic check, so I was waiting for the the speakers to blow you guys out of the room, but they didn't because we got some experts back there. Uh, how's everybody doing this morning? You guys doing all right? Good. Thumbs up. Cool. So um, yeah, welcome to the Buffalo Vineyard. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see your faces here this morning. We're going through uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke, which is, uh, so in the Bible, there's lots of different books, right? And in the, the beginning of the New Testament, we have the four Gospels, which really are stories about Jesus, right? Written by, uh, two of them were written by Jesus' close friends, and then two of them were written by um, kind of like friends of friends who wrote down the stories about Jesus. And we're reading the Gospel of Luke, which is one of those stories. This was written by Luke. And it's the, the account of Jesus' life and his ministry, right? And so we've been reading through that for quite some time, and we'll be reading through it for quite a bit more time, because uh, Luke is a long book uh, of the Bible. And so we're in Luke chapter 8, and this is kind of a crazy story. I mean, a lot of these stories are crazy when they involve Jesus. But if you want to turn to Luke 8 and listen, or, uh, and read along with me, you can, or if you don't have a Bible and you just want to listen, that's okay as well. And we are, let's see, where are we? Luke 8, right, 26 is where we're picking it up. So I'm going to read this, but pay attention, right, Uh, because I might ask some questions afterward. So Luke 8, 26, we read this. They, uh, that's Jesus and his disciples, sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet and in his right mind, And they were afraid. Those who hadn't seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and he left. The man with whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away. And he told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So that's our story. Kind of like a normal, normal Sunday morning, right? This is what happens to all of us. Wake up in the morning, cross the lake, uh, go hang out in some tombs. So, yeah, I, I, I thought I would just start by asking, what is something, what are some of the things that are just noteworthy? <laughs> Lauren's got a question. <laughs> Woo! Okay, all right. What's the deal with the pigs and they're dead and somebody owned them and that was an investment and what's, what's up with that? Yeah, right. That's a good question. Somebody else got a good question? Something, something to notice? I mean, what, just, what did you just, you know, hearing the story, what jumped out at you? What happened to the demons after they tricked Right. Did, did he trick the demons? <laughs> yeah, who knows, right? Somebody knows. Not, not me. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, absolutely. What else jumps out at you? Could be a question or something, just something you noticed. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's interesting, too. I mean, I know if I knew that there was a demon-possessed person in my town and then that person was set free, I don't know why I would be more afraid after they were set free than before when they were living in the town. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yep, we'll get some. Go ahead. You were sharing. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's definitely interesting. Jesus gives different instructions to different people. What were you going to share? Yeah. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Jesus is coming for you or? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, de- the demons are, are afraid of Jesus that he was going to torment them. Yeah. So there's a lot in it, right? And I, I'll be honest, I don't know that I have all the, even most of the answers to a lot of those questions. Um, and I mean, that gets at, well, a few things. First of all, I think just to clarify what my role is as a preacher and a pastor, right? Oftentimes, I think we think the pastor is the person who gives the answers. Um, and so, sometimes that's a part of what you do as a preacher or a teacher is maybe you'll read a passage and give an answer. But I think more often what a sermon ought to be or what a, what a preacher ought to do is open the Bible and then ask a lot of really probing questions and wrestle with Scripture. And that, that actually is all of our, our role is to then leave here and wrestle with Scripture ourselves and seek answers together as a community. And that doesn't mean that there aren't times where my role really is to say, nope, this is what the Scripture says and this is the answer to this question. But that's not always how Scripture works, right? And I think there are some, some of the questions we asked are just kind of like, huh, curious, what happened to the demons after they, did, did they drown? Are they in the abyss? Did they go find some other pigs? Like, what the heck happened here, right? I, I don't know, but then there are, maybe more questions that might be more practical for us, right? I mean, when we start thinking about demons and dark spiritual forces, I would imagine that there are a lot of, that brings up a lot of fear or a lot of, you know, questions about how things work in real practical, important ways that touch our lives or the lives of the people that we know. So, so we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to do my best to wrestle with this passage with you guys and share some things that hopefully are, helping us to see who God is, helping us to see who God has made us to be and what what it means for us to be, you know, people who are following the ways of King Jesus, right? Um, But yeah, there's a lot in here. I think that the main, I don't know, just the main storyline though, right, is that we have, especially when you put this into context of what we studied last week, right? Last week we read the story of Jesus on the boat. His disciples are afraid of the storm. Jesus wakes up and he rebukes the storm and the storm is calmed and the disciples ask this question, who are you? And then now we come uh, to the other side of the lake, right? So maybe just a few hours later and Jesus is confronting another storm of a very different kind, right? And this time, Jesus' Jesus's identity is still a part of the story, right? But instead of his friends asking, who is this? We have dark spiritual powers or beings actually declaring who Jesus is. You are the son of God, right? And so I think this, this story really is the story of Jesus and who he is confronting these demonic powers in such a way that this man is set free, right? And again, lots of questions about, you know, economic justice for the pig farmers, and I don't know what, you know, Jesus doesn't seem to address that, and, and who, who knows what is going on there or what happened afterward or why that happened that way. Um, That doesn't mean that as Christians we shouldn't care about economic justice for the pig farmers. We should, but in this particular story, I I don't. I don't have an answer for that. Sorry, Lauren. (laughs) We can. We can. We can come up with an answer. Yeah, Ben's got one. Right. Right. 
Well, so there's lots of theories actually about why it was okay that they lost their pig investment, but uh, I'm not going to get into that. But but it does point at the fact, like there's some there's some things we can tell from the story, right? So, so Jesus was a Jewish man. He was hanging out with Jewish friends, and they crossed the lake into a region that would have been filled with non-Jewish people more than likely. That's that's kind of what they expect, and the fact that they were Raising pigs is definitely an indicator that this was not a Jewish town, right? Because Jewish people don't eat pigs. And so there's, there's definitely some things there that are, that are worth note. Um, but again, I think this really is a story about Jesus, the Son of God, confronting the powers of darkness in this man's life. And he is absolutely and completely set free because of it. Not because of what he did. He was clearly in over his head. Right, the 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 story of of yeah, right. I don't I don't know if I was Goliath in that story or God in that story or what exactly I was, but we had the you know the story of the kids, um, and, and again, right, this is this is somebody who just like David was in over his head fighting Goliath. This this guy's completely in over his head. He has no power anymore, no agency anymore. Uh, in his own life. He's living amongst the tombs. He's crazy. And other, other gospels record that he was hurting himself physically, right? So this is, as Dave, as you pointed out earlier, this is a man in torment, right? This is a man who was in a very, very, very dark place. And Jesus, the Son of God, showed up and set him free. And I think that's really what this story is about. So uh, the next slide, I think the, the thing to, to this is... Um, kind of a famous painting of um, the, the angel armies pouring, pouring out of heaven to go and fight against the demonic armies, right? Kind of this picture of the, the last battle, so to speak. And the reality is, is that there, there, there is a kingdom of God and there is a kingdom of darkness, and they are at war. That is a, a reality. And I think you know, so, sometimes we can lose sight of that. We're, it's like, hey, I got I to gotta put food on the table. I got to take care of my kids. I got to, you know, make sure I'm not fighting with my wife too much. I got, you know, it's just like we got day-to-day life, and it's easy to just lose sight of the fact that there is actually a battle. There is actually a kingdom of darkness that does exist. That's a real thing, and um, it's something that, well, as Christians, we should be aware of that fact. Not, not that we should be unhealthy, uh, unhealthy and paying attention to it all the time, right? I think sometimes we're, we're tempted to ignore the fact that there is a dark kingdom or maybe we're tempted to pay attention to it too much, right? I mean, sometimes you hang out with people and it's like everything's, you know, everything's a demon, but also sometimes we're more tempted to think that nothing is, Right? And uh, I, I'm definitely not somebody who's got lots of experience with, you know, demons or weird supernatural things. But I have had experiences that I don't know what else to say other than, yeah, I think that was something demonic, right? And I would imagine that if we started kind of sharing those stories, some of us would have some crazy stories to tell. For Tammy and I, very early in our in our walk with Jesus, we were uh, we had this we were part of this ministry. Um, team and we had this encounter with this guy who and I'm like super skeptical so this guy's talking in strange voices and I'm like this is all fake like that's my response just so you know where I'm coming from right I'm like this is silly like this guy's just playing games with me Um, but it was kind of this crazy encounter and we were praying for him and and so that was kind of it and then that night Tammy and I are are in bed and I can't sleep I'm like terrified there's there's something in the room that's all all I could I just that's how I felt and I'm like laying there like this. I thought Tammy was asleep. And she's like, can you feel that? I was like, you're awake? I'm like, yeah, what the heck is that? She's like, I don't know. And so we just started praying and like asking Jesus to come and to like, whatever you are, you're not allowed to be here, right? And, and, and then, then it went away. And we felt peace and we went to sleep, right? So, you know, again, that's, that's like one of like two or three stories I have like that. I don't have a lot of stories like that. And that's not this, you know, that's not like a demon-possessed man being set free in the tombs, but I have had some of those experiences, and I would imagine that some of you have had those experiences before. That for, was for me like this reminder, oh, yeah, like, the, you know, this man that, that we were praying for, whatever was going on with him, whatever, however you want to figure out exactly what was what, like there is a war going on in our universe. There is a battle between God and between the powers of darkness, 
and we are living in it. And again, that doesn't mean that we should be pointing out people in the room and saying, ha, you're on the other team or you're one of those, right? But that like we do, so it's not that people are the enemy, right? Scripture says very clearly, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, right? We're not wrestling against other people, but there are powers that stand behind our world and there is a battle between good and evil and we can't lose sight of that. But also as much as, you know, this is this, this picture of angel armies, at the center of it is Jesus, Right? And that's who is at the center of this story and who is at the center of Scripture is Jesus, the Son of God, who ultimately has all authority. And when we talk about, you know, like angels and demons fighting or we talk about God and the devil, and when we use that kind of language, it's easy for us to think you've got God on this side and you've got the devil on this side and they're like equal but opposite powers fighting. But that's not the picture that we get from Scripture at all, right? If there are equal but opposite powers in the the war between (laughs) good and evil, there's like Michael the archangel and Lucifer the devil who are equal but opposite powers, and above them is God, right? And so even the fact that the devil or dark powers or dark spiritual forces exist is because God is allowing them to exist for a season and God will put an end to them and God has all authority to do that. And that's what we see in this story is we see Jesus as the son of God who has the authority to do what, he has the right to do whatever he wants in this situation. The demons are, and again, why did Jesus let him go into the pigs? I don't know the answer to that question, but clearly Everybody in the situation, including the demons, understood that Jesus was the man with the keys. He could do whatever he wanted. He was the one with authority, right? And so so we do have to pay attention to the fact that there is a war going on, but also we know who has ultimate authority over what is happening, right? And so I think these are things that this, this story should really make clear to us. And so while we should be aware of the fact that we're living in a time of conflict, we also should not be people who live in fear because we are people who belong to Jesus. So there's, there's this, the, the, these ideas of like the, the, the authority and the identity of Jesus and the conflict that we live in. Uh, but I also want to point out that there's a, so there's a, there's a passage in scripture I'm going to read from Ephesians 2, but this idea is something that lots of Christian writers have kind of tied together about that kind of helps us understand the the powers of darkness and what they are and what that looks like in our lives and in our world. So I'll read the passage from Ephesians 2. If you guys want to turn there, you can. Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3. Um, or again, you can just listen along. So this is Paul writing, and he says, as for you, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, right? And so this is this picture of like the powers of darkness, the dark forces that have corrupted and captured human beings. And he says, you were captured by these powers, right? But Paul specifically identifies three things that I want to point at. So one, he says, you followed the ways of the world, right? And that word world is something that the gospel writers use a lot in the New Testament. And they don't mean like you know, plants and mountains when they use this word world, right? What they mean is they mean that there is a system of thought and belief and action. There is a culture that is set up in opposition to God. That's what they're talking about when they talk about the world, right? Uh, That you follow the ways of this world. And I think all of us would, would say, okay, like I, kinda, I, I can kind of feel that and see that. But he goes on to say, right, so there's, there's the, the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work. So there is a spirit, there is a power, there is a person, there is a something there that also is kind of behind that world system, right? So that's a second thing. And then a third thing, he goes on to talk about the gratifying of the cravings of our flesh, Right, and that that word flesh is also a word that a lot of the New Testament writers use, uh, and they don't mean like our meat, right? They don't mean our muscles and our bones. There's nothing wrong with our bodies. There's nothing wrong with the mountains, right? Those are things that God created and He likes. But what the New Testament writers are, when they use the word flesh, what they mean is our desires that have been corrupted, right? 
And so that the, the, world, the world, the flesh, and the devil are these three powers that, again, Christian thinkers have been pointing at and saying, yeah, this is like when we talk about the dark forces on the other side in opposition to God, this is what they are, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil. So we're going to explore that a little bit. Next slide. So that is um, some, some Justin Bieber fans. That was taken at, <laughs> at a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> I know, I'm, pick, I'm sorry. To, if you guys are Justin, I don't know if anybody in the room is a big Justin Bieber fan. I'm sorry to pick on you. Uh, I, I could have used Bills fans, but I thought that would hit too close to home. So, <laughs> so I didn't, didn't go there, right? Uh, but, but... <laughs> So James, James writes this. This is a hard, hard words. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Right? That's really strong language. And again, that, you know, not that there's anything wrong with Justin Bieber or liking Justin Bieber or liking the Bills. But that, and it's not even, there's nothing wrong with even going and enjoying a concert or a game or getting caught up in the moment. I don't mean to, I don't mean that. But there is, so this is a story that comes from my own life, right? So, I was raised in a Christian house. I went off to college in kind of a rocky place spiritually, and um, my dad found this Christian group on the college campus that, that, um, that I went to, and he's like, please, just promise me you'll go visit it. I'm like, all right, dad, I'll go visit it. Um, so I went to visit this, this uh, Christian group, and I'm, I'm going to say some disparaging things about geeky people. I don't actually feel this way about geeky people now, right? But I, I was a college, I was an athlete. I kind of had this image of myself, right? And uh, I walked into this room, and it was like every single person had glasses and a pocket protector in this Christian meeting, right? It was like, this is, not only is this not my tribe, these are the people, I don't want anybody to see me with these people, right? And, but here's the thing. I, it's not like I, I, think about it all the time or dwell on it, but I have thought over the last 20 years, what would have happened if I would have walked in and let those people actually influence me for Christ? Because I didn't. I walked away and I walked back out into the world and back, back into hell, back into all sorts of craziness and pain and suffering that I brought onto myself. And I think about that from time to time. What would have happened if I would have walked into that room and said, Hey, will you guys be my brothers and sisters? Will you help me follow Jesus with my because I actually was there with some openness to that. And if they would have been like my tribe, I might have stayed. Right? And like that is an example of what I'm talking about when we talk about the world. And this could be big or small. Like that's this this place where I had been influenced by my culture and by what I thought about who I was and what the the, the voices in our culture were telling me. And it allowed me to walk away from God. Right. And so, I mean, we could talk about governments or, you know, technology or, or all sorts of aspects of culture. But the reality is, is that our culture tells us who we are and we listen. Our culture tells us what to think and we listen. Our culture tells us what is important and we listen. And all of that, all of those messages are not aligned with God's kingdom. And we have to be paying attention to that. And that's what James means when he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Right? Like that's, that's what we have to be paying attention to. And again, this doesn't mean that we should be point, you know, that politician's definitely the enemy, or this one's definitely on our side, or this, you know, like Justin Bieber, he's de demonic. No, I'm not saying that at all, right? Uh, but what I'm saying is that we have to be, <laughs> some of you guys are like, Justin Bieber is definitely demon-possessed. <laughs> all right, no. But, but that we have to be actually paying attention to what our culture is telling us, and we have to be holding it up to the authority of Jesus and saying, is this true or false? Is this something that is what God would want for my life or not? And that's hard. I get that. But that is what God is calling us to, right? So, yeah, I mean, that's a question for you guys. What are the things that you notice in the culture, right? And, you know, we're all different ages, different backgrounds, so we're all inter interacting with the culture in different ways. But what are some of those things that for you, you're like, okay, this is, a pl this is a message that my peers are giving me or that my culture is giving me that I know is actually in opposition to God's kingdom. And you don't have to answer that out loud, but that's a question for us to wrestle with. Okay, so the next slide. I don't know if you guys, you guys know this guy? <laughs> Augustus Gloop, right, yes, exactly. 
So he spends the entire movie with chocolate on his face, right? <laughs> he's, he's, he just loves chocolate. Um, and uh, that's a pretty good picture, image of what the New Testament writers mean by the flesh, right? And it's not that there's anything wrong with chocolate or eating. God made food. He, he likes that we enjoy food. He actually invented chocolate, and he's happy to give that to all of us as his, <laughs> his generous gift. But the reality is, is that obviously there's more to life than chocolate. There's more to life than food. And this is more than just food. Like when we think about gratifying the flesh, so I was trying to think of a, of a story, right? Because we tend to think of like sex and food when we think about like unholy desires. But it, I mean, right, the for 2,000 years, the church has been talking about the seven deadly sins, right? So it's more than just lust and gluttony. There's, there's wrath. There's right, all of these different things that are these desires, these urges that we have, right? And, you know, this, this is a small example, but probably one that we all can resonate with where, for me, I'm driving my car, and this guy's trying to cut me off, and I just kind of like, don't let him, Right? You know, it's su- super small, but it's, the, it's that little bit of wrath, little bit of pride that's kind of like, and you can feel it, right? This thing where you're like, yeah, I'm going to show this guy, right? And then you do, and you're like, yeah, I showed him, right? <laughs> and, you can, and again, if you don't drive, maybe, you, I don't know, maybe edge your brother out for the cereal bowl or whatever it is, but it's like that like showing somebody who's boss, right? You know what I mean? And, uh, and I actually, I had... Uh, an encounter with a guy on the the Skajakwita just a couple, maybe two months ago, where I kind of showed him who's boss, and then he, like, pulled over and got really crazy, like, stopped, and I was like, okay, so maybe that was dumb, like, I don't know, (laughs) we we didn't get into a fist fight, there was no, like, I didn't get out of the car, he didn't get out of the car, but it was, like, close enough where I'm like, oh, yeah, this could have gotten really ugly really quick, right, anyway, so the point is that it's, like, that's what, that's also one of these places where we have to be paying attention because the reality, again, one of the, one of the, the messages that our culture gives us is whatever desire you have, it would be wrong if you didn't pursue it. I mean, tell me that's not something that our culture tells us. Like the deepest, darkest, uh, greatest sin in the eyes of our culture today is not trying to fulfill your desires, right? Like that's really, I mean, I, I think you guys can see that that, and there's something there is something beautiful about that message, but it's actually a perversion and an inversion of God's truth, right? God has something unique for you that he wants you to pursue that will be uniquely fulfilling to you, right? So all of that is true, but our culture has that kind of like all pulled apart and put back together the wrong way. And so our culture will tell us, just look deep inside yourself and whatever desires you find in there, go fulfill them. And that is the way to hell. There's no other way to say that, right? And so whether that's pursuing chocolate <laughs> or, or pursuing, you know, wrath on the freeway or pursuing lust or whatever, those desires, and again, like what is underneath those desires, m- many of those desires are God-given desires, but they're twisted, right? God invented sex. God invented food, right? There, 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 are, there are reasons why we have these drives, but then they get pointed in the wrong way or towards the wrong thing. And so that's where we have to be people who are actually paying attention to our desires, right? Not just giving into them. All right. And then the next slide. So we talked about the world. We talked about the flesh. And now we're going to talk about the devil, right? Do you guys, I don't know, how many of you guys have seen this movie? Eh, all right, so I was, I was hoping I wouldn't have to explain too much the scene, but I, I guess I got to. So this is from The Lord of the Rings, or actually, I don't even know which. Yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah. But it's from, it, it's, yes, I said The Lord of the Rings, and I realized that's actually not just the name of the trilogy. It's the name of, the, name of one of the movies. So. But yeah, it's from, from, from the, 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 the larger Lord of the Rings series, but it's from The Two Towers. And this is um, Grima Wormtongue who is, he's kind of like infiltrated his way into the king's good graces and has been whispering in his ear for so long that he's actually polluted him and like weakened him, right? So this is this like big strong king who's supposed to be standing up for the forces of good against the forces of evil. But because of this voice whispering in his ear, all sorts of things, he's, he's not, he's lost his power. He's lost his goodness, He's lost his authority, right? And the, the, the word devil is not a name. It's not a name like Steve or John or Mary, right? It's actually a, more like a title, right? And so devil 
is Greek, Satan is Hebrew, right? And they mean the same thing. They basically mean the accuser, the one who accuses, the one who, uh, the attacker or something like that, right? It's, it's um, I mean, it's even a, a word that could be used like in a courtroom sense, like the prosecutor, the one who's like trying to, trying to get you convicted. That's, and that's, that's, that's this, right? This kind of like whispering, tempting, saying things. And I would imagine we've had experiences with that voice, right? Uh, and Jesus says, um, yeah, he's, he's interacting with um, some of his peers who some of them are actually even trying to kill him. And they're having this argument about who Jesus is and who, whose authority he has to say and do the things. And um, He says this to these people, right, who are trying to kill him. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And this this is what those demonic things or powers or voices are, is the voice of accusation. Uh, one last slide here. So this is a, a famous, um, uh, I want to say carving, that's not the right word. Um, st- yeah, statue, sculpture, thank you. Uh, celebrating, you know, the emancipation um, in, of American slaves in the 1800s. And um, I think, again, this is a story about deliverance, right? This is a story about Jesus showing up and confronting the forces of darkness that have bound this man and setting him free out of his authority. And I think that that's something that we should not lose sight of. Scripture talks about the gospel and sin, it, well, in lots of different ways, but there are like two big ways that we read in the New Testament about the way sin works and how the gospel counteracts that. And one of those is, well, it was actually in the language of of that passage in Ephesians, right? The language of rebellion, right? That sin is about us rebelling against God. And the gospel is the good news that God will forgive us and welcome us back even though we've rebelled against him. But also, sin in the, the scriptures is talked about as a curse, as a disease, as something that has happened to us, not something we chose, something we were born into that is bigger than us, that we lose our, we lose our agency to it. We don't have the ability to make choices anymore. And the good news is that God actually provides the cure and sets us free from that. And both of those are ways that Scripture talks about sin and talks about the gospel, Right? And they seem almost like opposite ways. And yet I would imagine that as I describe both of those, you saw yourself in both of those, I would think, because I do. There are ways that I have rebelled against God and need to be forgiven by him. And there are ways that I am cursed by sin and I have no control and it is something that controls me and I need God to set me free. Right? And this guy, we don't know how he came to be in the state that he was in. We don't know what decisions he made, what ways he actually kind of colluded with dark powers and said yes to them. We don't know what happened, right? But what we do know is he's in this place where he has lost himself and has no more power to choose, and he is hurting himself, and he is in the deepest, darkest hole you could ever want to be in. And Jesus shows up, and he sets him free, right? And that is what the gospel is all about. That is... God's invitation to us. And, you know, part of my story, you guys, you have to suffer through listening to me tell parts of my story every other week. Um, But yeah, I mean, I I was raised in the church and then took off, you know, and and lived doing a lot of dumb things, right? Mostly all all the kind of party stuff, right? Some drinking and some drugs and some sex and that kind of stuff. And probably what was underneath it all was just like rebellion. That was probably what was underneath it all. But in terms of what I gave myself to, that's what I gave myself to. And when I came back to Christ, um, we showed up at the, you know, the church that we always talk about as like this church that influenced us and and informed us. And so we showed up there and it was really the first time in my life that I was a part of a church that 
really worshiped. And what I mean by that is like they would sing like God was in the room, you know, and it was the first time I'd really ever been a part of a church like that. And so I would come into worship and this for like the first, I don't know, three or four months that we were a part of this church, I had this experience. So first of all, I would come in, people would be singing and I would be struck by, I don't know if it was maybe God's beauty or something like that. And I just would cry. Like I couldn't stop crying in worship. But then also something else would happen every single time is I would hear not audible voices, but there was a voice saying to me, you don't belong here reminding me specifically of my sexual history, but just, this is what you've done, showing me pictures. This is what you've, this is who you are. You don't belong here, right? And I didn't really, I didn't even think about it enough to like give language to that, you know? And again, even now it's like, well, I don't know, was I demonized or I, I don't know what you, you can call whatever you want, right? The reality is, is that's what I was experiencing. And I experienced that every single time I came into worship in this church, right? Um, Man, it wasn't fun. <laughs> but also, like, this experience of worship in God's presence was powerful, too, right? And um, so, again, this was new in my experience of the church, but one of the things that would happen in that church is they would invite people to be prayed for, right? And prior to that, like, prayer was just kind of like, I don't know, it didn't, it wasn't something that you invited people to receive or that you encouraged people to participate in in that way. But, you know, and I'd already been prayed for a few times, and it was, I was kind of at the point where I was just hungry for Jesus with my life. And so whenever there was an, uh, you know, they're like, hey, do you want to get prayed for? I was like, yes, pray for me. <laughs> just always, yep, pray for me. So this one Sunday, uh, pa- Mike, the pastor there, he was, he, I don't even know if it was connected to the sermon, but he said, hey, if you just kind of like want to be free of something, just come on up here and we'll pray for you. And I, honestly, I didn't even connect it to my experience in worship at all. I just was like, well, I'm going to go get prayed for because I'm that guy who gets prayed for, right? That's what I do because I just need more Jesus in my life. And I went up um, and it, was, it wasn't this lightning bolt moment, wasn't super, you know, wasn't like this at all. Um, it was very simple. I don't even remember if, if it was specifically Pastor Mike or somebody else that prayed for me. But what I, what I know is, Somebody prayed for me that I would be free of whatever was binding me, and then I never heard that voice in worship ever again. It was like gone. It's kind of crazy. It's like, okay. And then, like, since then, one of the things that has been just this meaningful connection for me with God is, is worship, like gathering together with God's people to sing songs like he's in the room, because he is, and experiencing his presence in that has been something that for me has I don't know, it just carried me through so much. Does that make sense? Anyway, so I share that story with you because that's my own personal, you know, deliverance story. And uh, again, I don't necessarily have all the right terms to, you know, like some, there are people in the room who probably could, you know, that, well, let me tell you what exactly what was going on, Pastor. And that's fine, you know. But the point of that story, just like I think the point of, of the scriptures that we're wrestling with, is that yeah, dark spiritual powers exist and they want to destroy us. <laughs> And, you know, world, flesh, devil, like how does that all intersect? You don't have to have that all perfectly figured out to know that there are dark spiritual forces in this world that are out for our souls and they're bigger than us. And it's too much for us to handle. But the reality is, is it's not too much for Jesus to handle. He has all authority over all of it. And that we can come to him and we can ask him to set us free. We can ask him to deliver us. We can ask him to help us discern. We can ask him uh, to forgive us. Like those are the things that we can do. And when we do that, he does. He just does. So um, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity at some point to just to be prayed for. Um, But we're going to take communion together. And uh, this... Yeah, I couldn't find a, the, the right picture that I wanted, but um, so one of the things that um, the, the Maasai shepherds oftentimes carry spears while they're, while they're um, guarding their, sh- while they're, they're tending their sheep for, for probably obvious reasons, because there's lions, right? Uh, and I know like that image of the shepherd is, is a, a common image that Jesus uses for himself, but we don't often think of him carrying a spear <laughs> doing battle with lions, right? But but I think that's, like, that's this powerful picture for me of what, of who Jesus is, right, and who we are. And, you know, that's, that communion is us saying, you know, 
like the communion symbolism is Jesus saying, here's my body, which is food, which will sustain you. But it's that same kind of idea that we're coming to Jesus and he's doing the things for us that we can't do for ourselves, but he, he can do them, right? He has the power and the authority to forgive your rebellion. He has the power and the authority to heal your curse. That's who he is and he wants to and he will. So, um, yeah, I'm going to invite you guys to come up and take the elements and return to your seat, um, and then I'll lead you guys in the taking of communion. So why don't you come on up and do that, grab, grab the, the elements and return to your seat. So the, the, the symbolic meal that we're about to eat was a, a real meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. So it, was, it was symbolic then too, but uh, had a lot more food on the table. But um, yeah, Jesus, t- he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it. He did the same thing with the, the wine that he had. And in both of those cases, he said, right, this is my, my body, this is my blood, it's for you. He encouraged us as his people to remember his death when we eat this meal right? But also there's this, this, so it's in, in many ways, it's this pointing at the, the price that Jesus paid for our problems to be dealt with, right? But it's also, again, it was actual food that they ate and they took in. And uh, I just want to read, this is the, the words from the opening of John's gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, and all, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone has come into the world. And so in essence, we're being invited to take that light into ourselves, to take that life into ourselves, that that's, that's what communion is a symbol of. So, um, yeah, as we, as we take the bread and eat it, we're saying, Jesus, we want your life in us.
And in the same way as we take the juice and drink it, we're saying that we recognize Jesus, the, the cost and the price that you paid, but we accept that and we want what you have to offer us. We take and drink. Bless you. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So before I offer a benediction and um, send you guys on your way, I just want to offer you this, the same opportunity that my pastor offered me, right? So maybe there's a place in your life that you could identify, man, I'm like, bound up by something. And, you know, just so I'm, I'm going to invite you to stand and receive prayer. So I'm not necessarily expecting like all the people who really struggle with lust are about to stand up or anything crazy like that, right? You don't have to see it that way. I think there are places where we can feel overwhelmed by, again, whether it's the world, the flesh, the devil, where we feel like we're confronting something. Maybe it's a lie that you know, I don't know, somebody spoke over you when you were a child that has resonant, just rang in your ears your whole life. I don't know what it is, right? But maybe there's something that this morning you feel like God is pointing at. Maybe it's something you've been thinking about during the whole service. I don't know. But if that is you this morning, again, the word from scripture is that the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And so I just want to invite you to stand up and we'll have some, just the person next to you put their hand on your shoulder and I'm going to pray a prayer over you uh, before everybody else stands. Yeah. You can stand. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, so again, if this morning you have something specific to you that you're like, yeah, I just want to be set free. I want God to deliver me. Specifically, if you're like, oh yeah, that fear, yes, that one's for me. Thanks, Chuck. If that's you, I just want to invite you to stand and we're going to pray for you, okay? So we've got a handful of people praying. And just if you're, if you came with the person that's standing, would you put your hand on their shoulder? Um, <laughs> and if there's somebody who's standing that doesn't have anybody next to them, maybe one of the leaders in our church can go and stand with them. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light is coming into the world. The true light that gives light is coming to visit you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come. We invite you to come and to settle on the people that have stood up this morning. We thank you for the act of faith, just of standing, of asking for prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would deliver them.
If you're praying for somebody, you can keep praying. But I just pray, Lord, for people in the room who are bound up by fear. God, I pray that you're, you would pour your love out on them, that you would release them from fear, that you would speak your peace and your goodness over them. You're the God of hope, the God of a promised future. We pray, God, that you would set people free from fear, from the anxiety, from the worry about what might be coming, about what might happen. Jesus, would you come and reveal yourself as the Lord, as the one who has all authority and the one who makes promises that come true. So I know in some places people are still praying. You guys can keep praying. If you're here and you need more prayer, don't leave. Um, I'm going to offer just a prayer again for the people who stood up and then for the rest of us. And if you're wanting to like go grab a cup of coffee or fellowship or something, go downstairs and just leave the room quietly. If you're still in a place of prayer or ministry, whether you're giving it or receiving it, just continue to do that. But again, God, I pray by the power of your spirit and Jesus, the authority of your name, that you would deliver your people. And I say to you, in Jesus' name, you're free, free of fear, free of the the bonds of whatever the world or the flesh or the devil is speaking or saying or doing in your life. You're set free by the person of Jesus. And to the church here. Know that you are free and also that you have the authority to speak that freedom and offer it to others. In the name of Jesus, amen. So again, if you're, if you're praying, continue to pray. If you want a fellowship, just kind of sneak out. <laughs> Do it downstairs, please.